Does everyone see my slides now? Sure do. Okay, excellent. Let me just kind of get them going and bear with me for one second. If you go down at the bottom and push the big Okay, side, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yep. Okay, Jill's right. gonna get started. Hi everyone, and I, um, you met Ivy and myself, and we're two of the co-founders of the EGFR Resistors patient group. Go ahead. So, next slide. Okay, so I'm first gonna give you just a little background for those of you who don't know lung cancer that well, but it wasn't that long ago that lung cancer was considered the invisible disease, and the only distinctions doctors could make was whether a person had small cell or non-small cell lung cancer. And there were literally 20 years ago, three treatment options, actually even less than that, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And because of the nature of the disease, survival was dismal. I hate to use that word, but it was. And 10 years ago, in fact, it was probably five-year survival rate in general was about 14%. But thankfully, lung cancer was one of the cancers that the TCGA studied and research started moving in the right direction. And this chart shows the actionable mutations in non-small cell lung cancer, which is on the right 2019. And actionable mutations, meaning targetable mutations, and that group continues to grow actually. But with the targetable, targetable mutations and therapies, treating lung cancer has become way more complex and complicated. And it, if you look on the chart, you could see that some of the oncogenes are very rare. Um, but because of research moving in the right directions, right direction, patients started living longer and better lives. And next slide, please. Subsequently, we have and continue to build an army of lung cancer advocates. And with the discovery of the oncogene-driven lung cancers, uh, patients and caregivers started building these online communities specific to the type of lung cancer that they had. And the groups continue to grow in number and in size. And as you all know, social media has been great for connecting, and especially when you have a rare type of cancer. And so for these oncogene groups, Targeted therapies are usually the best treatment option, but they aren't a cure. And inevitably, the cancer develops resistance in all of us, unfortunately. Um, and so while I talk about the great progress, most of us are still depending on that next promising treatment, which is why these groups are so important. Um, there aren't patient groups for every oncogene, but the groups that have the most members in them, I would say that you're familiar with are probably EGFR, ALK, and ROS1. Next slide, please. Can I ask a quick question about yeah. those, Bill? Sure. Um, when you look at that slide, I know that, um, I, I really actually am only familiar with the ROS wonders and how they broadened beyond the lung cancer um, yes. space in a couple. Have any of the other oncogene patient groups done that? Yes. So and truck that is one that is found in um, other cancers as well, that there are some similar similarities. And does, does BRAF include? Oh, Oh, is, yeah, I was just looking. Is that last one? I can't even see the screen. The last one is BRAF is really small at this point and not completely, you know, organized yet. So I'm not, I think it probably will eventually expand like that, but I don't think it is right now yet. So just to give you a little bit of background too. So some of these, uh, you know, like KRAS is found in other cancers as well. But right now that's non-small cell lung cancer. And, you know, ROS1 and, and, and like EGFR is in colon cancer, but 
they don't behave the same in every cancer. So when you're looking at ROS1, when you're looking at NTRAC, um, there are more similarities, number one. And number two, they are so rare that also coming together as a group is really critical. So, um, and like they're so rare, you, there's not even enough patients to conduct a randomized control trial, a phase three trial. So it, you know, that, and that is why these groups are so important. And ROS1 was the first group to kind of get off the ground because of that exact reason. Yep. Thank you. Okay, next one. So our groups offer patients and their families hope, support, education, empowerment. As you all know, cancer fosters an instant intimacy and there is nothing like connecting with someone else in the trenches. So someone who gets it in a way that no one else can who hasn't lived it. And the, our groups are especially important for the specific oncogene cancers. Ivy, you wanna to go to the next? Yes, I will. So um, we thought we'd give, we'd give you a little summary about um, who the EGFR sisters are and what we do. Um, seven of us, including Jill and I, founded uh, the, the group about three and a half years ago in August of 2017. And we felt at that time that there was a need for a group of patients and caregivers who could share information, support each other. And we also wanted to be able to collect some patient data with an overall goal of improving outcomes for EGFR positive lung cancer. We connect in a variety of ways. We have a closed Facebook group that's only for our members who are the patients and caregivers to use to communicate with each other. But we also communicate with um, the whole, you know, um, lung cancer and other, you know, cancer community through our website, our Twitter and our Instagram. And we have a monthly newsletter that comes out. So if you don't already follow us on social media, we would love it if you did. And you can even sign up for our monthly newsletter if you want more information through our website, which is egfrcancer.org. Um, of the seven founders you see on the screen, unfortunately two are no longer with us. Um, both Terry and Anita, who are really our first two founders passed away um, way too early, um, about, I think it was about two years ago now. I, I'm used to saying, you know, about a year, but it's, it's been a while now and we continue to advocate with continued urgency in their honor. Since our initial formation, we have grown a lot from our original seven. We have about 2,500 members now across um, nations, 2,500 members internationally with patients and caregivers from more than 75 countries. While we have both patients and caregivers, approximately 85% of our members are patients. And we have a highly motivated community that gets involved in advocacy, educational, oh, and fundraising opportunities. But what's um, very important and what drives us is the fact that many of our members have experienced resistance to their medications. And because of that, we are we have a sense of urgency to work hard to accelerate research in EGFR positive lung cancer. One thing we did when we first created our group that has been important to us and we have come back to many times since is that we wanted to define what our purpose was in order to make sure that we spent our time on efforts and projects that fit this purpose and not be distracted by many other worthy things, but things that don't necessarily fit our specific purpose. So as a result, we created our goal, our vision, and our mission. 
our overall goal is to improve outcomes for all of those with EGFR positive lung cancer by accelerating research. And I'm gonna go into the ways we work to improve outcomes in my next slide. Our vision is to change EGFR lung cancer into a manageable chronic disease, um, ideally eventually into a curable disease, but we're certainly not there yet and we're not even there for the manageable um, chronic disease, but we hope this is something that can be accomplished in the not too far future. And our mission is to raise awareness of EGFR positive lung cancer and to address the gaps that exist both in clinic and in research. And we've been working towards this mission since we were founded and we'll discuss some of those efforts in the rest of the presentation. We aim to improve outcomes for our disease using four main methods. Um, the first one is supporting patients and caregivers, which we do through our closed Facebook group that we mentioned before. Um, since it's a closed group, patients and caregivers can freely share their concerns with confidentiality or with as much confidentiality as you get in a closed group on, on Facebook. Um, the second is by increasing awareness and education for our members, and we do this in a lot of different ways, including providing um, information and firsthand experiences with treatment and trials, um, tips for communicating with healthcare teams, um, sharing information about symptom and side effect management, and helps with as asking the right questions. And all of this assistance really builds confidence for patients to take charge of their care and advocate for themselves. And as a result, many end up becoming lung cancer advocates and advocating for others as well. Our third um, method is, or our third um, way that we improve outcomes is by improving access to effective diagnosis and treatment. We share information about important issues like getting second opinions and how to contact people for second opinions, the importance of having biomarker testing, having repeat biopsies upon progression, um, suggesting ways um, for financial assistance and information about clinical trials. Um, so much is changing rapidly in lung cancer and depending on, you know, where they live and their situation, not all patients and caregivers have the same access. So by doing this that we do to improve access, we hope to give patients the ability to bring some information about testing and treatment to their doctors who might not know all of the information that others who are in different positions might. Last and certainly not least is our efforts to accelerate and fund research. And we'll talk about this um, on the next couple of slides. So um, as I mentioned before, our mission is to understand the unmet needs of our community. So in order to do this, we've really focused on developing relationships and communicating with all the stakeholders in the lung cancer community to drive the important research questions. Based on that, we've strategically identified projects to address these questions and answer the unmet needs. So in order to do this, we have not become a 501c3. Instead, we've created research partnerships with advocacy organizations and industry to assist with the project and also the education and funding for our projects. And we're gonna talk about these a little bit later. We're, um, we're not limited, we're open and interested in working with any organizations for future projects who share our purpose and our priorities. So here are some of the research collaborations we've been part of, 
up so far. I won't go into this in great detail, but as you can see, we've partnered with some of the major lung cancer advocacy groups like GoTo and Longevity. We've partnered with industry, AstraZeneca is an example. And we also have a fantastic partnership with a company called CEC Oncology, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about now. Without CEC Oncology, um, which is a group that focuses on continuing medical education, the EGFR resistors truly would not be what we are today. Joni Fowler, who's the president and owner of CEC Oncology, reached out to us soon after we launched in 2017. And we share a common interest in EGFR positive lung cancer. So in 2018, <laughs> helped us secure a grant to hold a special think tank of EGFR thought leaders to discuss the gaps in practice and research for EGFR lung cancer and ways we can target these gaps. We, the think tank was fantastic and we had a number of prominent oncologists attend in EGFR lung cancer and this really helped us zero in on our group's priorities. Since that right. think tank, we've done a lot with CEC Oncology and we've incorporated our patient perspective into a number of their efforts. We've worked it with nurses, including a symposium on developments in EGFR positive lung cancer at an ONS conference and a series that focused on educating nursing chapters on the importance of biomarker testing. We have worked with CEC Oncology to do a virtual symposium, which was originally supposed to be live at ASCO this year, about the facts and myths of EGFR lung cancer. And we even created a poster walk for our community members from ASCO, highlighting abstracts and posters of interest to the EGFR community. We have a number of other projects in the works with CEC Oncology, including a three-part webinar that we're working on right now about um, resistance and progression. So they have been a fantastic partner for, for us. We um, held an EGFR Resistors Research Summit, um, both in November 2019 and again in 2020. And this was one of the ideas that came out of our original think tank back in 2018. Um, basically, the, the point of this research summit, and you can see from the two pictures up there, you know, we managed to pivot it to virtual this year, was to encourage young investigators, um, junior faculty, et cetera, to continue to do research in EGFR positive lung cancer and collaborate earlier on in their careers. CEC Oncology partnered with us and helped us to secure funding for this, um, these research summits. Now, the key thing about these research summits that was so cool um, is that, you know, while the young investigators got experience in presenting their research, a lot of times it was research in progress. So it couldn't be shared publicly yet, but the young researchers got to develop collaborative relationships between each other, amongst each other, and amongst the mentor judges who were um, knowledge leaders in the EGFR community. So we divided the young investigators into squads where they got to work in small groups with these experts and they received fantastic mentorship opportunities and things like grant writing, publishing, clinical trials, and, and other areas, and hopefully start at the beginning of lifelong career-wise relationships that will really motivate them to keep working in, in this field. Um, let me talk a little bit more now about our collaborations with Longevity Foundation. We recently collaborated with Longevity on a huge real world research study called Project Priority. Priority stands for Patient Reported Initiative on Resistance Incidents and Treatment Study. Project Priority is patient driven and patient funded 
a patient driven and a patient funded research partnership. Sorry, they tripped me up a little there. <laughs> Um, we created a comprehensive IRB approved 130 question international survey with input from patients, caregivers, clinicians, researchers, and regulators. The reason we did this was um, for three main objectives. We wanted to understand the needs of the EGFR positive lung cancer community, identify areas for improvement in diagnosis and treatment, and give voice to patients' concerns about a variety of topics, including risk factors, treatments, and side effect management. So here's the, the timeline of our study. We started working on the goals and questions for the survey at the very end of 2018 and collected baseline data from two different cohorts between April and May of 2019. We split up the data into two cohorts because that allowed us to analyze our initial data from cohort one and look for important trends earlier. We then combined our data from the two cohorts and were fortunate enough to be able to present our findings at IASLC's World Lung Cancer Conference in Barcelona and North America in 2019, among other places. The longitudinal portion of the study, which we gathered the data for a year later, included follow-up questions and some specific COVID questions. And we have presented some of this data at IASLC North America this year, and well, last year in 2020, and also just had a mini oral and poster presentation at the World Lung Cancer Conference in January. So Jill will talk a little bit more about the longitudinal portion of the study in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, um, I'm going to share with you guys just a quick snapshot of some of our baseline findings. Um, we, a big deal is biomarker testing for, you know, all of these subsets of oncogene-driven lung cancer. So we found low rates of biomarker testing, which unfortunately wasn't surprising. We kind of we kind of know that that's the issue. But the high rate of hospitalization that we found in the EGFR lung cancer community was really surprising, especially since our patients are generally considered to be younger and healthier. Um, we also found that there are still a lot of patients in the U.S. who are not receiving the um, FDA-approved first-line treatment of osimertinib. And we also found, and this was kind of disturbing, that there was a significantly high rate of patients who were actually diagnosed with depression at 25%. And this is diagnosis. So this likely completely underestimates the number of patients who actually suffer from depression since so much depression goes undiagnosed. Can I ask a quick question, Ivy, sure. about the, the biomarker testing? Yeah. Um, so remind me again, so this went out to all lung cancer patients, not just your EGFR. No, this actually went out to EGFR lung cancer patients. However, Longevity is um, working on a project that kind of grew out of this that's currently going out to all lung cancer patients called Project Peer. So this was almost in a way the, you know, the pilot for, for that. I, the only part that was confusing to me was it, it it went out to EGFR, so by default, they had to have some sort of biomarker testing to know that they were in the EGFR cohort. Right. So they didn't, okay, so yes, but a lot of them didn't have that biomarker testing as soon as they were diagnosed. So this asked about biomarker testing a diagnosis. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, that's, yeah. I was just confused. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like a lot of times they're just put on a treatment at the beginning and they don't find out, yep. you know, what their biomarker is until later on or until they get a second opinion. So that took account, did, took that into account. Did the survey break down um, that 40% on like whether they were treated at an academic medical center versus in the community? Did it break it down by yes. race? Did it break it down by age? 
Yes, yes. Wow. We have all, yeah, we have all of that data, you know, I can't quote exactly, but you know, it was definitely higher numbers, you know, as you would expect, um, get their biomarker testing, you know, right up front in an academic institution as opposed to in the community. But we do have breakdowns of, of it in many, many different ways. Awesome, thanks. Sure. Um, one final slide before I turn over to, to Jill. Um, this slide shows why the data we collected from Project Priority really matters. Um, if you look at the side effect profiles, if you look on the left, there's um, the green column show side effects that were reported by patients in the FLORA clinical trial. And on the right, those columns in blue show side effects that were reported by patients through Project Priority. So when you look at this, you're looking at clinical trial reports versus real world reports. And, you know, you can see how different um, side effects you know, reporting can be like, look at the line for um, fatigue. I think if I go to, yeah, there it is. Um, in, in Flora, you know, 21% of people reported fatigue where in, pro, in Project Priority, 78% did. And that just shows how important it is to look at real world data. You know, the, the patients who participated in the clinical trials are not exactly the same as all the real world patients who have brain mets and prior cancer and other comorbidities. So it's really critically important to look at things like this with um, where we can get, you know, actual patient experience and real world data because the small percentage of patients who participate in clinical trials aren't always a true representation of any community. Um, I'm going to turn over to Jill now to talk about um, some more project priority learnings that we found. Thanks, Ivy. And I think something important to point out here is that, you know, with all these new targeted therapies, TKIs, they're called, and, you know, you take a pill and you don't go in for chemo, you don't lose your hair, you don't have the traditional side effects. So we, we often hear the oncologist talk about how much more tolerable <laughs> they are. Well, tolerable is relative, right? So they may prolong our lives and better our lives in terms of you know some day to day stuff, but it's not documented how you know our quality of life and how we live. And as you can see, there's still large number that experience side effects that require hospitalization. But some of us may get a grade one or grade two, and while we don't need immediate medical attention, it can affect everyday life. So we are really pushing for uh, real world data to complement existing clinical data and research data. We think it's important. One other thing I want to point out uh, before I go start on the slide is that while we have a diverse group of patients from all over the world, our community really represents the more educated, empowered, and connected patients who are fortunate and privileged enough to have access to resources. So this is not data coming from some of the under-resourced communities, which they, they represent 80% of people diagnosed with lung cancer. That's the majority. Ivy and I represent, and you know, I think Terry's on this call, 20% of lung cancer patients. So it is a huge unmet need in our community. So this is the longitudinal study and the participants, the respondents, and when we talked to them about perception of palliative care, they rated it uh, palliative care, symptom management and supportive care, both before and after reading a definition of these constructs. So it 18.6% palliative care showed the highest improvement in favorability rating after they were provided with the definition. And really for us, this 
underlines the misconception that exists about what palliative care means and the need for increased education of palliative care services from the start. Um, but the fact that respondents had a different perception of symptom management, palliative care, and supportive care shows how critically important it is to use consistent language when discussing these constructs with patients and caregivers. And I know we've talked about consistent language before. Um, next slide, please. So this was um, part of what we just presented at World Conference uh, in 2020 in January, but it was, yeah. Anyway, so one of the things that we wanted to look at is the patient comfort level in talking to their physician. So we ask questions to understand how comfortable they were. And the data presented on this slide shows that a large number of patients really don't feel comfortable discussing side effects, treatment, or their worries and concerns with their doctors. And the lack of comfort level is exacerbated for patients outside of the US. Next slide, please. Um, as you will note on this slide, many patients don't feel that their doctors understand them as individual people. And about 30% feel that their doctors don't answer their questions about future treatments and concerns. Again, the perception is even stronger in patients outside of the United States. But it's not surprising considering the previous slide on comfort level. Next slide, please. So I just want to do a quick time check um, because I know that a lot of people have to leave at the top of the hour. Um, I, I do want to leave time for questions because you guys have created something amazing and I know that there's others who would like to figure out how they can recreate that. So I don't want to stop you from explaining. Oh, the that's fine. It, I'm literally, I think I have one or two slides. This yeah, is, we're almost done. Okay, perfect. <laughs> So just real fast, what this is here is I, it can't be compared, it's not real data, but I wanted to understand the perception of oncologists. So I did take a poll on Twitter. And you, as you can see, the majority believe that they know their patients well, indicating you know there is a disconnect between many doctors and their patients. Okay, next slide. And going back to Longevity Foundation, what's really exciting is we just collaborated and we will be announcing this month uh, two research projects that we will be able to fund due to successful fundraising from our very motivated community. And that's all, if you have questions about that, I'll let you know. And then we just like to recognize Anita and Terry, the two co-founders, because they were the force behind it. And really their guidance and efforts helped develop this project priority as well. And we are still analyzing data on project priority. We still have more data to analyze. So hopefully we'll have more stuff coming out. I love it. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and I'm so sorry, Jill, I didn't, I didn't mean to take you off your game. I just know that oh, no, no, no. That's we, fine. we've got some questions um, in the chat. And um, one of those questions, which I think is a great one is, do you have plans to take this, um, what, what you've just explained um, to the, the under-resourced communities? Where some people may not even know, you know, what EGFR is and that they should have access to biomarker testing? So that is a great question. Um, and that is something, yes, that we're working on that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, I've spoken to some people in this group already about it and I'm speaking you know, to more in the future and please reach out. Part of the problem is, so part of the problem is that, you know, there's lack of biomarker testing. Like when I say lack, I mean a very small percent in community settings actually do biomarker testing. And so it's, it's a problem. So patients aren't necessarily getting the biomarker testing. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do is push out the importance of it into those communities. 
And so that's one thing that we'd like to do. And then something else uh, that we're trying to do that I just gave a talk at World Conference on diversifying clinical trials and in a disparities press conference, I actually tried to reach out and find an advocate. I, who am I to speak on behalf of those communities was my first thought. Um, and then I realized I can amplify the voice, um, not necessarily speak on behalf, and I should, and it's my responsibility. But we are, we are looking for advocates. Um, we, they're in Chicago, University of Illinois at Chicago, they have a program and they work with a lot of South, you know, commun South Side communities. And so I've spoken with them about trying to get involved in those communities. What I'm really struggling with is um, really kind of that first step in creating those relationships. And so who do I reach out to begin with? I mean, I've re reached out to hospitals, but who in the community do I reach out to? Do I reach out to, um, I know somebody I reached out uh, that I spoke with on Twitter, Katie Richardson, if you're on Twitter, I'm sure you all follow her. So I said, I, I was asking her and she said that, you know, every, you know, depending on the catchment and you can reach out to some of the government funded services. She gave me a few ideas there. Um, and she said, it's, you know, I said, do I reach out to sh social groups? Do I reach out? So that is anybody who has any, any um, advice or help on that, that would be great. Because when I tell you 80% of people diagnosed with lung cancer are from under-resourced communities or face those barriers. 80% and there's a quarter of a million people diagnosed each year. And you know, the reason I'm here today is because I was lucky to be born <clears throat> in a white middle-class family in the United States. That's it. And that eats me up. So I, we appreciate any, and yeah, I do get emotional about it sometimes, but I, we appreciate any help, any advice when it comes to that. So Jill, just as first blush, I, that, that request, that need, I would suggest um, floating through the advocate collaborative in the Google group. Um, I know that, you know, Sanford has done, and, and he shared with us many community-based activities um, also, the faith-based health ed um, in Oakland, there's a woman, Cynthia Carter Peralt, that, that does amazing things here. And actually, the, the Archdiocese um, of Oakland does a lot of, well, now things are different because nobody really can gather in person. Right. Um, but really trying to, to push health education, um, both in kind of risk reduction, but also in let's reduce the stigma of talking yeah. about some of these things. Um, yeah, Sanford gave me some, I did reach out to him. I'm actually talking to Barbara in a couple of weeks and, you know, anybody else, because that is, you know, it's something that it's a global problem and you, disparities are global, but they're, the disparity is local, depending on where you are. Right. So, and that is, and, and that is hard to tackle, but we need to start somewhere. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'd love to speak to um, anybody else. And yeah, also Roberta you. mentioned that she, she brought COVID into the conversation, which it, it is part of the conversation. Um, and so there's a lot of efforts on how do we reach um, minority communities, whether it's vaccine hesitancy, whether it's um, masking up, whether whatever it is, like the same avenues that you that you would go into the health community for COVID can also be things that you look at for um, for for what you're trying to do. And that that part of it, what I found is um, really what it, what I found was more the medical side of it, though, with you know reaching out to minority physicians, reaching out to the hospitals, getting the buy-in, the trust, 
um, not when I was looking to for the presentation I gave, I couldn't really find much on advocates. Um, I don't hear when I talked about University of Illinois Chicago, uh, they have done a great job with some of the South Side communities, a great job. And I think one uh, nurse had said that the community she's working with, she's gotten up to 80% to say they would get the vaccine. And we're talking about these are the, you know, I mean, multiple constructs of, you know, disparities, but the South Side of Chicago. And so it, yeah. I think it's important to get people from those communities sitting down because sometimes people plan these activities for this group and nobody from the group is in it, you know, and a, a close um, uh, experience last night, I'm, I was preparing for a, a course uh, webinar they're going to do in Spanish. So I commend them. They have done, this is the third one they have, they're going to be giving in the last month and a half. And then I say, what about questions? And they say, well, no, people are going to, uh, it's going to be a live video, but people cannot ask questions because they're not going to be, they, they're not going to be answered. And I said, and she said, when we do it in English, we do because we have somebody there uh, that understands, but nobody from the staff understands Spanish. So we are not doing the live. And I said, but there's a lot of Spanish speaking of us because in Coleman, we are doing coffee shots and we did one in Spanish. So we had, I was the moderator and another person was looking at the questions and we both spoke Spanish. And Liz, who's the administrator of the advocate, she didn't know anything about Spanish, but we could follow. So if you don't sit somebody, they assume, okay, this is okay. It's not okay because it's not fair. It's, it's people after the conferences that the questions come up and they won't be able to ask them right there. So, you know, just sitting there with people who know their community and could be, you know, like a hum and it, it's logical for us, but not for the people who's planning. So I love the presentation. That's why when you sent the link the other day, uh, Stacy, which I appreciate because I never go into the website that and, and our Google Drive where I know all these things are, but in the email it was good to just click and while I was working, looking at it. So I saw the work that Jit is doing and we're gonna meet next week. But that's a really good, that, that is a really good point. And that is last January, I was, I think Roberta and Valencia were there. I was at a um, summit and they did a whole session on you know, on, on disparities, uh, African-American community, LGBTQ+, Native American and Latinx community. And afterwards I asked a question and I said, you know, I've been trying to figure out because I have talked about it with different organizations, how to reach the unreachable communities to get them the resources they need. And one woman looked at me and asked, how do you know what they need? It was like, in, I was so humbled, but I was also so upset with myself. Of course, how the hell do I know what they need? Who am I to think I know? And I learned about cultural humility. And that's when I really was like, we can't assume that's dangerous. That's relinquishing responsibility, right? And so just like you're talking about, Barbara, uh, the only thing we could do is help bridge to the communities, but they, they have to speak, right? And so, you know, it, but, but what I found is, and I talked to Sean Johnson too, um, what I found is that, and he mentioned, he sent me a paper he wrote, you know, when you're talking about the, the structural racism, they're so much more comfortable people medical professionals talking about external factors, right? Like governmental policy, then they are talking about racism and discrimination as a social determinant or, you know, profit. So it, it, it's just the whole thing is, yeah, mind boggling. Sorry, anyway. Um, I, I recognize that we're at time, but um, does anybody have any other questions for Jill or for Ivy? I have a comment uh, for what, but going back to the, where you talked about uh, uh, oncologist and patient communication, there's, um, I'm gonna send it into the chat, but there's a, 
uh, it was out of University of Rochester probably 10 or 12 years ago. It's called Voice, B-O-I-C-E. Um, the head, the one of the PIs happens to be at Rutgers now. So I'm part of his research lab, but it's um, what they do is we just spent the entire um, lab meeting this morning talking about this. And it was a really challenging conversation because it was, we not only do we need to um, do patients need to ask relevant questions, mm -hmm. but oncologists need to know how to help patients ask relevant questions. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, the other part of that was um, we also need to care for how do we support the oncologist? Because especially when it's end of, you know, if it's a, a change in diagnosis, meaning you upgrade to like, you know, stage four, or you upgrade, um, upgrade sounds terrible, but you know, <laughs> it sounds like it's a good thing, but it's not. But um, it's the, sort of the, how do we support oncologists? Because that's really challenging conversation for them to have. And so then we talked about medical education and how that's changing as well to sort of embrace more of this humanity, humanitarian aspect and the humanities part. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna send this PubMed um, is the is the um, publication, but we're actively working on sort of other parts of this. So if any if it, if it's helpful, I can um, you know we can talk about. I'm happy to talk to you about any time about sort of the research that's happening in that world. Please. And the, so Jen, uh, it's a huge favor to ask. Would you please just send that to the Google group with some context? I, I hate that oh, yeah. um, the people who aren't here miss, miss that context. Right. Yeah, no, that would be great. I actually right. gave a talk at ASCO Education this summer, the symposium on physician patient communication in the era of precision medicine. I'll share that too, but I real that was something else that. And, you know, I really feel bad for these doctors though, right? They, right. they need help in all of, for all of this, they need help too. Yeah, our oncologist in the lab setting this morning was just, he said, this is what, this is the news I had to deliver today. And so he said, I'm working really hard to transition to giving you this presentation, but you need to know where my head is. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. the most underrated skill of a physician is the ability to communicate effectively with patients and families. And in, you know, what I kind of got out of the whole thing is the data-driven, clear data-driven conversations aren't the most important, right? You know, you, you, goals of care and first and yeah. So anyway, I know we're over, but yes, please. I would love to have that link. Um, I have a, a question. It's sort of going back to the data-driven thing. I love that you guys are using like, uh, you're trying to sort of say what the important questions are for the KRAS groups. And uh, so there's two questions I have. In BRAF, we're really trying to have investigators use uh, circulating DNA to sort of figure out when there's resistance so that we don't just keep treating, that we actually like switch it up and, you know, maybe re-challenge. Is anything like that going on for lung cancer in EGFR? They are looking, um, I mean, there is there is use of, of ctDNA in some places uh -huh. to measure upcoming resistance. Actually, one of our um, founders um, had her most recent resistance found through, you know, using ctDNA and it showed up um, that way before scans, but it's more, um, it's, it's not commonly used everywhere. It's kind of like a, a kind of a newer way of tracking things. I think part of the issue is, you know, there aren't, I mean, at least in the EGFR community right now, the, everyone is, is getting osimertinib as their first line drug. Huh. So if you find, you know, progression prior to it showing up on the scan, it's good news you know, to know that information. I mean, it's not good news to have progression. It's, yeah, it's yeah, good yeah. to know that information, <laughs> but you might not necessarily want to switch anything up at that point because, you know, there aren't really, you know, that many options outside of trials yet, but it's, it is being, you know, looked at and what trying to figure out where it would fit, you know, in the whole resistance, you know, analysis. And the other problem with it, though, is the sensitivity, right? So then if you are shedding it, 
then great, it works and it works well. And maybe it could pick up something that tissue wouldn't. But if you don't, um, you know, then it doesn't work for everybody. And also there's uh, within our community, one of the mechanisms of resistance is the cancer goes from being non-small cell cancer to small cell, which is a very different and a very aggressive form of lung cancer. And you can't pick that up through, um, you know, CT DNA. That's really interesting. That's really important. Um, you know, there's two things. One, a MDA researcher and CRC, she's like, what she talked about is like reducing disease burden by pushing, pulling back um, before resistance. Um, so that's, so that might be important. Um, oh yeah. But, mm -hmm. but the, there's also in CRC, and I don't know if it's going to apply. Although I do know, K, you know, KRAS is more of a driver mutation in lung cancer. But there's a second line CRC treatment that has expanded um, compassionate use, unvanservative, I think is how it's called, and it's like not only is it like being used as a second line treatment uh, in trial for CRC, but the KOL said that they're looking to add immunotherapy to it. And what is happening is that they actually can see a reduction in the KRAS uh, mutation uh, for like up to like 90% or un almost even undetectable on people who are on this. And one person, uh, you know, uh, he actually got to surgery on a second line treatment, which does well begs the question what was the first line treatment but two it's still like pretty amazing so we're still working on this in CRC and I think we're a little bit more sensitive uh, more sensitivity BRAF is incredibly sensitive to um, BRAF to, to you know to seeing what's going on um, but the real question I had for the day was uh, it, for in her too they're using these uh, adjugate drug conjugates mm -hmm. and they're getting these amazing results. And I know in Australia and at MD Anderson, there's an EGF are sort of targeted treatments. It, how is that going? Cause that seems incredibly important. Those are being looked at in clinical trials right now. There are several um, the, of these ADCs, antibody drug conjugates yeah. that are in clinical trials kind of targeting various different things as, you know, um, treatment for post, you know, osomeric progression. And some of them look very promising. And yeah. several members of our community are actually on those trials. So yeah, it's kind of an exciting, you know, new treatment really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But guys, I hate to I hate to stop us here, um, but I actually have to to drop before another meeting. Um, but I do want to thank you guys, um, Ivy and Jill. Thank you for sharing with us, and um, I would encourage everybody.